Hello everybody. Uh, today we're going to do a brief tutorial, a shortened version of the um, new tutorial for Spike Interface, which is a um, program that represents a workflow and collection of uh, spike sorting algorithms. We first see this represented in the paper that came out last year in eLife. Spike Interface, a unified framework for spike sorting with Dr. Alessio Buccino as the uh, first and corresponding author. So if you have questions about um, the development of how they made this program or further applications, I definitely refer to this paper. Um, Mostly what we're going to work off of is a shortened version of their most recent Spike Interface version 0.90 August 2021 tutorial notebook. And this notebook comes in with the installation of Spike Interface. So definitely want to say that the code is credited to Dr. Buccino. Um, there's a link to his publication. Um, so what I did, you know, prior to running this notebook here, which I'll include in in my GitHub is that you'll need to clone the repo um, from Spike Interface. Uh, you can set up a new environment as it states above here. Or what you can do is you can pip install <clears throat> the requirements.txt file, uh, which is what I ended up doing. Um, importantly, make sure you're up to date with your Xcode if you're running on a Mac. Maybe just up to date with all your packages in general. So I had some other previous versions of Spike Interface on my system. And while I don't think that they interfere, um, I ended up just removing them in order to install this new version 0.90. because so I was getting some weird <clears throat> module errors before that. Things weren't the right versions and so on. Um, so I put my install workflow here. Um, they also have that on their GitHub. Whatever works for you is great, right? So um, I ran each of these lines in a command line, and that eventually gets me to this notebook here. Obviously, you'll need to download my shortened notebook if you want to run through my notebook instead of theirs, and copy it into um, that directory. What you're going to need to do is download the dataset. So we're going to use this Cambridge data.bin file, and you can find that using this uh, Zenodo link here. And there's a couple other data sets in there, so feel free to look around in there and maybe try to apply those. Um, we're then going to import our packages. So if you're following other tutorials um, or some other online information, um, sometimes the packages were imported differently, um, you know, as ST or whatever. So make sure that you keep these consistent. Um, or at least remember what you imported them as later on. Um, great, so let's run these cells. Then we want to load the information that we've downloaded, our electrophysiology data set, into um, our Python program here. And depending on how you completed that install or where this notebook itself is and where the Cambridge data is, um, that's going to alter you know various paths that we're going to use. So. I have my Cambridge data bin file in my downloads folder. Um, and we're also going to input some information about what that data set is. So the number of channels, in this case it's 64 channels, but maybe you have 32 or less. Um, and also the frequency at which they're sampled at. So we've got 20 kilohertz here. Then we want to read the file here and get that recording extractor object. So basically what we're doing is we're combining all of this information from the EFIS data set with our parameters here. So we read in the recording file, we have num channel, sampling frequency, etc. Great. If you were looking at previous tutorials from Spike Interface, um, you might have seen that they actually use the spike extractor object um, in their recording folder. So, you know, just be aware that using the different Jupyter notebooks um, that they provide on their GitHub are all incredibly useful and sometimes use uh, different terminology because they're constantly updating and developing the software. Um, great. Regardless, this read binary function uh, returns this recording extractor object, um, which now allows us to look at some of its properties. So we run the binary extractor, make sure you can check if it's annotated. 
and then we can take a full list of all of these recording extractors. Um, so depending on um, what your EFIS data set is and where it came from, you know, such as if you use Spike 2, um, that will help you actually um, interface from the uh, data collection to the data analysis here. Um, and as you can see here, like Dr. Pacino says, a recording extractor object extracts information about the channel IDs, channel locations, um, etc. So let's take a look at those, right? We had 64 up there. And we can see, look, we've got all 64 channels. We've got our sampling frequency. And this is getting pulled out of um, that recording that we read in. If you don't want to read in your whole recording, you can just take a small snippet which is what we're going to do here. Um, you know, let's say we just want two seconds. So we have our start frame here, start at zero. And the first two seconds, well, that's the sampling frequency over one second times two. And, you know, of course, that gives us our 40,000 um, and 64 channels. So the widgets module is really important and useful for plotting. And what we're going to do is, you know, I'll run the code again here, is plot just the first four channels across time here. And we can see that, like, yeah, our data is read in. We are able to plot things. So far, so good. Um, and if we want to plot just a small amount of time, we can do that as well. As always, if you want to know what the other arguments that can be used with anything in Spike Interface or, you know, Python in general, we can ask it a question, and we can see that there it is. There's time range, channel IDs, or you can just plot the whole thing. But in this case, that's just going to be a bunch of bars because it's 64 channels. So um, one of the other great things about Spike Interface is the ability to load probe information. And they actually have a lot of probes in this public library here. If you import probe interface, and let's take a look here. And as I state here, in most experiments, this neural probe, so like the electrodes themselves, are interfaced to a head stage, which is on the mouse's head. And that in turn connects to the acquisition system. Um, if you want to see what this looks like, and if you're not familiar with electrophysiology data or setups, um, you can click this link right here, and that'll show you a picture of what some of these setups might look like. But in simple terms, they're saying probe. They're talking about the electrode setup, and if we want to take a look at the specific electrode that they're using here, we can take a look. So we've got four shanks, and there's our 64 channels. Okay, so there's a couple built-in things we can do with our probe. If we look here, we've got shank one, two, three, four, and if we look at our actual probe, similar, right? So going through and adding the probe information is really important. Uh, makes your life a lot easier. And we make this to a, uh, we create a data frame out of this using pandas. And we can save it. Okay, so now everything is nicely organized in a pandas data frame. We can then set probe and what this will do is it'll group it so there's one, two, three, and four shanks here. And then here's the channels, which is 0 through 64. Running the next two cells, we see now we have all the contact IDs. And then the shank IDs here. All right. So next we can look at the actual properties. So we'll mostly skip over this section for the sake of time. But the important thing to note here is that properties can be added, um, such as like brain region by channel. And you can look at the properties before the probe, properties after the probe, so that adds in this location and group. And then we can assign properties to things by location and group, such as brain area property values. So like here we're going to take the first 32 channels and we're going to assign them to CA1, which is an area in the hippocampus. And we're going to take the second 32 channels and assign them to CA3. And we can see that we've done that. And then we're going to add these things into our data frame using this dot 
um, set property function and look now we've got location group and brain area so if you're interested in just analyzing what's going on in CA1 or CA3 differences between them um, etc you'd be able to do that so so now we're going to do some pre-processing we can do this by group um, as we split up by four uh, before um, and then you know as we will almost always do in electrophysiology we'll use bandpass filter um, which just filters the frequencies within a certain range so here we go we've got the spike toolkit here that's ST um, bandpass filter function we have our recording to process right here Oh, and you know, forgot to mention this, but what we've done here is just selected the first group of the recording to process. Um, so you know, we have the four groups, and we're let's just focus on this one for the sake of this tutorial. So we've got the recording to process, which is just the recordings by group, which is just split them out with the first sixteen channels. Um, our minimum frequency for the bandpass filter and our maximum frequency for the bandpass filter. So what we're going to do is plot those first 16 channels, um, you know, group zero. And this is after the bandpass filter. And we can actually see some really nice spiking activity. When we look at the unfiltered, so before we did the bandpass, we can't see any of that spiking activity, you know, lots of noise. The other thing that we can do as a pre-processing pre step is we can use the common median reference, and you can refer to that YouTube video that's linked at the top of this Jupyter Notebook if you're interested in seeing or learning more about that. But basically at each time step, we're removing the median, and that removes some of this common line noise that helps clean the recording even further. So we can do that, and we can use the spike widget uh, plot time series to plot that again. So, Next, we want to sort the data, so, you know, classic spike sorting. Um, so we're just going to do that over a small amount of time. Um, importantly, and, you know, they stress this in all of their tutorials and videos, but all of the operations in spike interface are lazy, meaning that they're not performed if not needed. And so a lot of these things are cached, and so they happen really quickly, but what you need to do is save them and reload them. Honestly, this is just good practice in general for anything that you're doing. <clears throat> okay, so let's call this one processed four. You can call it processed, um, but because I've done this a few times, uh, we'll use processed four. And we write this out. And we can make sure that it is indeed there. Um, okay, so then what we're going to do is we're going to, we have these uh, recordings saved, and we're going to get those channel IDs, and we're going to. Um, compare them to using the spike interface loading the extractor so we load that folder and let's make sure it's the same it is fantastic right so we've got all of um, that first group so you know group zero um, right there and we can plot them side by side here just using the spike widget plot time series again and they indeed do look the same all right, so next we can get on to spike sorting. And one of the first things that we can do is just check which sorters we have installed. So, so far we only have herding spikes. How did we even get the spike sorter? Well, <clears throat> we can look at the requirements.txt file that you know we use to install it, um, unless you made an environment. And we can see it's indeed right there. I do walk through two other ones, how to do that in the longer tutorials. You can do MATLAB-based ones or use the Docker as well. We can check the default params, actually run the spike sorting algorithm. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort, that's the herding spikes. Um, there's our saved recording. And we're going to create this output folder called results. Great. So we've completed that. And what we can then do is double check. Perfect. <clears throat> Looks like all of this information is in there. 
Um, as I said before, there are some other spike sorters, such as Iron Clust, that you can use. Um, and I'm not going to run through this one, um, but they do have this in their full-length notebook. <clears throat> what we're then going to do is go back and use the spike widgets um, to plot the rasters of our sorted spikes. Here's our sorted spikes that we ran up there. And there we go. There's the raster, or we can plot the autocorrelogram. You can also run multiple sorter jobs in parallel and compare them. Um, and that's one of the advantages of spike interfaces. It really does unify all these various spike sorters, and you can see which ones are similar or why you're getting different results when you're running one spike sorter versus another. Um, and again, we'll skip over this information on the Docker, but know that it is possible to use the Docker. Okay, so now that we've sorted our spikes, um, the next step is to actually extract the waveforms. Uh, we're going to use this spike interface extract waveforms function using, using our initial recording, so recording saved, and then our herding spikes sorted. We're going to create this folder called waveforms herding spikes. And just like that, it's done. Perfect. So at any rate, let's plot those. Um, again, using spike widgets, and if you go into the GitHub and look at the widget gallery, you can see that there's a lot of different widgets or ways that you can very easily plot your information. So when we plot the waveforms here, or just the templates here, um, at any rate, we can also plot the unit waveform density using the spike widget function. We can plot the amplitude distributions, or we can plot the amplitudes as time series. So what I've shown you here in these last few images are just some ways that you can use spike widgets um, on your waveform data. Um, all right, so then there's various things we can do for post-processing. Um, the very, you know, most basic one, doing PCA, and just getting the spike amplitudes. Running down the notebook, we can complete some of these basic template metrics, um, such as peaks, peak to valley, peak to trough, um, half width. And it's nice because it saves these all in this data frame for you. All right, and we can then use another spike widget to plot peak activity map. And this is just here, you know, I can comment this out, but it's just as a refresher for you remember what each of these little um, terms means here. So SI for spike interface, SW for the widgets. So just using peaks there. And last step that I'm going to show you is how to get this basic quality metrics using the spike tools. You know, the toolkit as seen here. <clears throat> and what we can do for that is this will give us the firing rate um, and other metrics as well. And we can display that right here. Now we've got a um, nice data frame here. And look, we can see the firing rate right there, a presence ratio. Um, so that's all that I'm going to include in this short tutorial. I showed you how to um, do the basic install, uh, read in some data, and extract, sort it, um, and uh, showed you how to use some spike widgets also. Um, so, you know, the longer tutorials in the notebook, check out um, the Spike Interface GitHub, read the Spike Interface paper, and again, a big thank you to Dr. Lucino and his colleagues for um, creating this uh, software. Uh, it will be used by many neuroscientists.